Hi everyone, this is a 3rd to 4th century BC Ptolemaic period oil lamp found in the city of Thebes, Egypt. It's very cool, I love little artifacts like this, I also like learning about the creation process. Um, why are we talking about this, and why do I have it? Well, never mind the second question. There are so many interesting material details on objects like this. Objects with stories that hide their creation process. Things that, you know, I've been wondering for a while, can we take elements from them and use them for artistic effect? Like, can we take the data from objects like this and combine them with new procedural techniques to create new types of artistic materials? This is something people have done before in 3D space to different degrees. I have a technique I'd like to explain to you today. And in the process, I'll kind of be explaining to you how I created this semi procedural procedural clay shader, which can wrap around any object. It has lots of nice surface details sourced from real life imagery, but that imagery has been combined with procedural techniques, so generated textures, mathematics inside of the shader editor in Blender, also combined with a Voronoi scattering method, meaning that the image sources we use for these materials don't have to be seamless. This is a callback to another video I did a while ago, I believe it was titled Create Amazing Materials from Simple Images in Blender. I have access to objects like this because of a project, which I've mentioned on the second channel before, called Project Provenance. At some point I would like to scan these into 3D space to make them available for people online, but before I get to doing that and before I get to creating new materials for people to use sourced from some of these artifacts, I need to make sure that I have a pretty good method down, which is why I've started with making a clay material and this also ties in to a new product that I've been working on, which I mentioned in the last tutorial, which should be a collection of sculpt procedural materials. So if you're a sculpt artist and you want to have access to good materials that will make your objects look great immediately, then that's something I'm working on. So let me just put this away so I don't damage it. I've also got a couple of um, 19th century collection tickets for the uh, oil lamps they came in a pair of two. Alright so here I am in Blender and here is the clay material I've created. I'm quite happy with the result of this, we can see there are different kinds of surface imperfections. These are all layered together dynamically, we can actually identify that here, we can see that we have different height textures for fingerprints, scalp effects, scraping which would be like the um, knife combing across the object and these are all mixed using slightly different mixing modes but just adding them together progressively as different layers. Having different blending modes is entirely personal preference when we're mixing together these image samples because depending on what the imperfection is you might want to blend them together in different ways so that requires some experimenting just to see what you think is appropriate and it kind of makes sense because when you're working on a surface like clay depending on what you're doing to get that imperfection like whether you're scraping the clay or combing it or just like pushing it in. You can imagine that different behavior as a different type of blending mode. So it makes sense that if you're kind of combining these image sources together, you'd be blending them in different ways. That's also opportunity for artistic effect. Now, we're calling these semi-procedural materials. Why? Because just combining textures together isn't really procedural. Well, that's where this scatter node comes in. So this is a node I have in my procedural patterns pack, which lets you scatter imagery using a Voronoi scatter technique. What this does is it takes Voronoi cells. You'll recognize the Voronoi pattern if you've done anything with the Voronoi texture, then it projects the image inside of each of these cells, and then with the parameters you can randomize the location, rotation, and scale slightly, and also blend between the cells to make it look like they are kind of seamlessly connecting. I recommend this video by Jonathan Lampel, part of the CG Cookie Crew, who breaks down the technique. This is the video I watched when I created my own simple version of this node. So that's what's happening. Each of these image textures has their vector input decided by a Voronoi scattering node. There are separate ones for each of the textures because the scale needs to be be changed individually. That's because as we take the image samples, the scales of the details are inconsistent and maybe we want some artistic control over deciding how they're going to be scattered over the object. It would have been prudent of me to clean up this material before doing a video about it, but you know, forgive me. That's why there are like loose unplugged nodes scattered around the place. So again, like I said, at some point this material will be available in an upcoming product I'm making about sculpt materials. But let's take a look at what the outputs look like after they've been scattered. And we're going to move on to talking about how I created the image samples soon. So just stick around for a bit more and I'll explain that process. But before we do that, let's take a look at how the image samples actually look in Blender as they're being scattered. So this material largely relies on normal data, meaning that most of the surface imperfections are actually just coming from the normal input of the principal BSDF, meaning that we can give it any color, which you know is great for more artistic control. But I'm just going to reset this to something kind of grayscale for now. So let's take these image samples individually and see what they look like as 
as they're being scattered around. So this first image is a fingerprint one. So I created a fingerprint sample in the clay, took a picture of that. I then converted it to a height map. This conversion part of the process is not something you actually really need to do because you can actually just plug a basic RGB image in and use that as your height information. But it's gonna be quite noisy and a bit scatterbrained, but that's a perfectly viable artistic method if you wanna do it like that. But just to show you, plugging this into the color here, you can see what it looks like. Now, obviously this is strange because this is height information that's gonna be plugged into the normal. If I actually unplug the normal, we can see that clearly. But you can see here how we have the fingerprint lines as they're scattered and blurred around. This kind of wavy noise pattern here is actually a symptom of the edge warping, which we can reduce and increase. It's just a way of making sure things feel less tiled and more seamless. In this case, it doesn't really make too much of a difference as we can see. And we can also blur the edges between the cells. This one in particular probably doesn't require much warping. But also if I kind of change the random values, you can see how the image is trying to be scattered between the cells. The next image sample converted to a height map is the scrape texture. So this one here, you can see it's like we've gotten a comb or a knife in this case and kind of scraped out information from the surface of the clay. Mixing them together, we get something like this. So we can kind of choose between the fingerprint and the more scraped texture. And I chose a kind of balance somewhere in between. When using image samples like this in combination with Voronoi scattering, you want to make sure that the projection mode is set to box on the image texture. That's just something to keep in mind. The third height map I'm using here is a scalp one. So this one, quite different. It's a larger scale one, something that looks kind of more appropriate when we visualize it from the larger models. Again, you can play around with the values here. We don't necessarily need the edge warping going on. Let's just plug this in as the... Uh, height for now. What you can see when we're just visualizing it as normal data is that that scrape effect gives us these cutout areas here next to the fingerprints and the scrape lines. So I can reduce that with the mix node here set to darken. Notice at zero we just have the fingerprints and scrapes and as I add that we get the scalp cutout lines. And again using the parameters you can blur that to kind of like null out the effect. So I like to keep it at a kind of balanced value of like 0.8 on the darken mode that look pretty good. And we can see some other areas here like how the clay's kind of been chiseled out of that shoulder. So a lot of this is just a matter of like balancing values because taking creative image samples from direct pictures like this can produce some quite unbalanced results. But I still think it's like a very creative method. It gives you a lot of freedom. You don't necessarily need to worry too much about like the setup. And then I have a second fingerprint height map. Let's just check this one out. There you go. So this is like a larger scale fingerprint effect, kind of more obvious with its waves. And again, combining this all together, in the normal, we have quite a nice complex multi-layered imperfection for a clay material where we can again like adjust the presence of those different layers by adjusting the different mix sliders. So like I said, it's completely procedural, meaning we can rotate around any object and watch as the effect kind of wraps around. And because it's procedural, it means that we can adjust any value, modify them with like different kinds of math nodes or other generated textures to get new artistic results. Another thing I've done here at the bottom is I added some extra little uh, flex, I guess you could call them, because when you're working with clay when it's wet and if you're scraping you can pick up little wet debris of the clay which can then kind of like settle on the surface and it just looks like tiny pieces on the surface so with a noise texture here or alternatively a Voronoi if you want to make it more spotty I've added these flex zones where it kind of looks like wet clay has been picked up and then just randomly deposited back onto the surface again. So how did I make the samples? Well that's actually quite easy and quite fun. Got a slab of clay I think it came from Italy uh, air drying clay off of Amazon as well as some basic sculpting tools. Then I sat down and just worked on some disposable plates, although I have now brought a lovely wooden tray to do future work on. I just kind of went ham, really, um, creating different effects on basic clay slabs. They don't need to be particularly thick. As you can see, this is quite a thin one. And because I've kept it in a box, it hasn't like dried properly, so it's still quite bendy. I thought it'd be interesting getting kind of different varieties of patterns. So this one was done with a butter knife, whereas something like this, as you can see, it's kind of like a much more complex pattern. It was done with using more of a scalpel tool where I kind of like push in and folded over parts of the clay as it was wet to get a kind of more broken and chaotic pattern. Once I was happy with these, I basically put the different trays of them out by my windowsill and took some high resolution imagery of them with my mobile phone. Again, one of the things I like about this process is you don't really need like a particularly complex system to create cool artistic results. So yeah, I just used my phone and then transferred the images to my computer, converted them to PNGs because they were the .hec files, you know, the uh, Apple format. And then using Affinity Designer, I I crop them down into square images. This is another thing I like about the process is that if you have physical samples, you could get hundreds, maybe even like thousands of different images from these just by taking it in different lighting conditions or taking different angles, or even if you have good image taking capabilities, just zoom in more. 
Like, you have an infinitesimal physical object here. The more you zoom in, the different patterns you're going to get. But again, taking it from like a macroscopic scale, we're getting my artistic pattern, and I've used that as the image sample. So like I said, you could just take that straight into Blender and scatter it around an object using a Voronoi scattering method. But if you want to get some nicer height information, then it's a good idea to convert that into some form of height map. You can also convert it into a normal map. You can get AO masks for it, etc. Now, there are different software packages available to do this. Some are free and open source, which I haven't experimented with yet. But for this project, I used Substance Sampler, which is now an Adobe product. Now, I do not endorse Adobe's pricing for their softwares, and I'm not a particular fan of like the subscription model, but I have used Substance tools before, especially Bitmap to Material back when doing game development stuff. And Substance Sampler is kind of like the newer form of that, although it also allows you to do photogrammetry in the software. Their newer version of map generation is apparently AI assisted. I'm not entirely sure how, but they say it is. And I can give you a demonstration of how it works. I mean, here I am in Side of Substance Sampler with one of the image samples from this particular slab here, but I might as well do this from the ground up again. So let me create a new project and I'm just going to drag in my image. From here I'll get a variety of options because Substance is trying to interpret what I want to do with the image. So we'll do image to material, AI powered. You have the option of B2M, meaning bitmap to material, which is their old version. We don't want that. So let's import. And it's going to try and automatically calculate interesting maps from our image sample. Now obviously this is not a tiling texture. And for the Voronoi scattering in Blender, like we said, you don't actually need to have it tiling. But just to show you, in Substance you can just make it tile. Again, let me go to the assets, fill filters and search for make it tile. If I just drag this above the image to material layer there, then it's just going to automatically make it seamless. Notice how it's done that for all of the maps at the same time, which is very handy. So now we just have a seamless texture slash material created from a cropped version of our sample. So that's great. We get all of these details and we can see all the different maps here on the right. If I click through them, this is what it's generated. From here, you can right click and save as bitmap. It doesn't just have to be a bitmap. You can choose any main image format. And that's basically how you can then take it to something like Blender. The height map in this case is the most interesting one for me because it's the one that we're going to substitute for a regular texture when uh, combining them together to make this normal information. Notice how the final result is plugged into the height input of the bump node. Now we'll say about the software, like I said, there are other alternatives available for generating maps like this. And also you don't have to get the substance products on an Adobe subscription. You can, <clears throat> you can get them on Steam on a perpetual license, which is what I've done. Basically on Steam, you can purchase the actual software and you get one year of updates I believe. So I have purchased Substance Sampler 2023. I like this method of purchasing it because it means that, you know, even when the updates stop, you still have the software available to you, the 2023 version. And I think that's fantastic. But there is also a free trial available on Adobe if you want to give it a try. But just keep in mind that it automatically signs you up for a subscription if you don't cancel the trial. And I believe that you lose access to the free trial if you cancel it. So if you do that, make a note to cancel it if you don't want to get automatically signed up into a subscription. Yes, that's a bit scummy, but you know, that's just how it is. But I wanted like a nice tool set again, like if I'm going to be taking samples from other items, I feel like it'd be nice doing this in a kind of professional way. Sampler is also quite an interesting software from what I've gathered, because there are loads and loads of filters you can use to kind of modify the visuals. For example, I like this one called Dust, which is about kind of simulating the accumulation of dust over time, as we can see here, and we have like procedural values. So I can basically make my clay more dusty and the results are great. And it's basically generating the information on all the different maps at the same time. Very powerful. I love that. So there's lots of artistic opportunity. I'm still kind of like learning about the tool set. Kind of gives me inspiration for developing my ambient grunge node for Blender more. Again, that's actually something interesting now that I've been learning more about these techniques for combining procedural and real life image samples. It's making me want to go back to my old products and improve them with samples which I create in real life. I also think this kind of adds more authenticity to like the creation process of materials because sure, at some point soon we'll be able to get AI generated materials fairly easily in Blender. I know that there are people that are going to be working on that, but I've always maintained when talking about like AI tools that the desire for authenticity and novelty for that matter will always be present. It always has been whenever technology is improved and it always will be. Whether it's the desire for food prepared by a specific chef, motorbikes produced by a specific company, firearms, wine, cheese, etc. Like manufacturing processes change, but there's always a desire for something special. Like there's value behind authenticity. And I like the idea of exploring exploring handcrafted procedural materials that are created using samples from ancient artifacts or kind of physical artistry and combining that with 
procedural methods. So I just thought this might be an interesting video. It's not necessarily a step-by-step -step tutorial. It's more of just like a breakdown saying, hey, here's a technique I've been playing with. Voronoi scattering combined with image samples which I've created rather than image samples I've found online. Once you've created your samples, you can get so many different variations of images from them. And by combining them in a layering method, again, being quite considerate of different blending modes, you can get lots of different kinds of effects going. And again, if you watch my last tutorial relating to making procedural materials in Blender, you'll know that masks are like the key to everything. They basically allow you to tell Blender in the shader editor where to place pixels, where to change pixels. You can perform mathematical operations on masks and creating interesting masks is like the cornerstone for procedural materials. With this method, what it allows you to do is sample more complex masks from real life, but use them to inform procedural processes. So for example, one thing we could do again, going back to that last tutorial, is take an ambient occlusion node and use it to restrict the location of where real life samples are placed. So for example, if we only wanted realistic scraping effects to be present on like higher curvature areas of a mesh, that's very easy to do just by combining these two elements. So yeah, hopefully you found it interesting. And if you made it this far through the video, then put some kind of cutlery related emoji in the comments, maybe like a knife and fork, because I was using a knife to like do some of the scraping effects. Also consider checking out my products on curtishold.online slash store, including some of my procedural material products, such as modular metals. You may also like my modular workspaces add-on, which not only adds buttons to quick access the asset browser but also gives you some interesting templates to help create some starter scenes with like good lighting templates atmospherics etc i recommend you check out the announcement video for that it also helps you to unpack collection assets if i go to my workspaces tab here so if you create collections and mark them as assets you can just drag in those collections press the unpack button and it will automatically organize all the objects center them on the world zero unpack them into collections in the outliner so it's a really cool workflow tool to speed up your startup process i have other resources and tools available for you as well, both free and paid. We do community projects such as the Community Material Pack, a collection of free materials, EasyBPY for helping you write Python scripts, and more. We've got all sorts of other projects. And if you like my work, you can check out my Patreon, patreon.com slash Curtis Holt. And of course, feel free to subscribe if you're new here. So yeah, have a fantastic day, happy blending, and I will see you next time.